Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Lucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to Drive On. I'm your host, Scott DeLuzio, and today my guest is Dr. Stephen Sidoroff. Dr. Sidoroff is a psychologist, a professor at UCLA, an author, a consultant, and a thought leader in the field of resilience, uh, peak per- performance, and transformational psychology. And he's known for establishing innovative training and uh, treatment programs across the globe and for hosting summits where he interviews world leaders in longevity, resilience, and leadership. Dr. Sidoroff has also made significant contributions to brain and behavior research, and he's here today to discuss his new book, The Nine Pillars of Resilience, The Proven Path to Master Stress, Slow Aging, and Increase Vitality, and we'll get into uh, a lot more, I'm sure. Um, but but uh, before we get into all of that, uh, Dr. Sidoroff, welcome to the show. I'm really glad to have you here. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here, Scott. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, giving your audience some very useful tools. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I think in the military we uh, we get – we get various tools kind of drilled into us uh, from the very early days of you know, basic training. We, we learn a bunch of different things, but, but sometimes dealing with stress or you know, resilience and things like that, sometimes it either gets lost along the way or um, we, we just don't know how to apply it in, in the day-to-day life. And um, you know, I guess maybe let's just start off with why, why do people have such difficulty with managing their stress? This is a imp- very important question, and it's important for people to realize they're not alone in that struggle. Everybody has difficulty with stress, and there's some structural reasons for it and practical reasons for it as well. So it's important to, to begin by realizing that one of the difficulties is that stress is not just bad, that... <clears throat> It's a survival mechanism, and so your audience would be particularly aware of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's so ingrained right down to our DNA, right down to our genetics. And so I like to, to begin with, to reframe stress and the stress response as a useful tool as long as we keep it in balance. And that's always, so that's the key. And it's important to, again, to realize that we're all struggling with it because if you think about all the successes in your life, you will realize that all of them have been accompanied by stress. That's right. Yeah. So think about that. Every time we are have a success, stress is part of the package. So what happens in our brains, our brains have put those two things together. Stress, success, and it could be, you know, success achievement, or it could be success just, you know, avoiding getting killed if we're in a battle situation. So we have to realize that it serves us, but we have a responsibility to find our stress sweet spot, the level in which our both performance and our health is optimized because most of us shoot beyond that optimal level into the danger zone. And that's because we have so many situations in our day, in our lives, that trigger the stress response throughout our day. But we don't have any or very few triggers of the opposite. We're safe. We can relax. We can let down our guard. And so we have to, that's where our intention comes in to find time and places to engage in that recovery branch of the stress response. So that's interesting that, that so many of us just live in the stress world, right? In, in the, the, you said the danger area of, of stress. Um, and when you think about how stress 
and success uh, are correlated the way you mentioned. And I, b- before you mentioned that, I hadn't really thought of it that way. I, 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 I've correlated, uh, you know, failures with success. Like you, you, you typically, there are uh, a lot of times there's, there's failures um, where you, you try something, doesn't work. You try it again, doesn't work. You try something different and you keep making adjustments until eventually, Hey, you got something to work and it, you know, I, I'm, I'm successful, but there's gotta be a lot of stress wrapped up in that. Right. It, it, because I, I, just the other day, my, my son was trying he was trying to learn a magic trick and, and he was, he was doing this thing with the cards and it, it just wasn't working out. And you could see in his face, he was getting so frustrated <laughs> and the, the stress and, you know, for him and, you know, he's 11 years old, so it's, you know, relative, but, um, you know, for him, he was getting all stressed out about it because it's like, I'm doing, I'm doing what the thing tells me to do and it's not working, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's getting all frustrated and, um, you know, but I'm like, man, better to, better to learn a little bit of stress now than, uh, you know, gears down the road. So, you know, it's in a way it's kind of a good thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but it, it, it's gotta be, uh, you know, that that's, it's a good point that you made that there, there is stress accompanied with all of the accomplishments that we have had. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And, and, you know, talking about your son in his situation, one of the key lessons in this process of engaging in stress throughout our day, throughout our lives, is learning the lessons of the encounter. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people talk about resilience as the ability to bounce back. And I say that that's outdated. Okay. And that really, resilience is the ability to bounce forward. Okay. And, and what do I mean by that? So your son is, is struggling to learn these magic tricks. And we can relate that to any, any stress in our lives where we're struggling or we have a stress coming up and we're worried, am I going to be successful? We are anxious. What's going to happen? Or we may think of the negative consequences. And then the the stressful situation occurs and we're successful. Mm -hmm. Now here's the key. What happens with most people is they bounce back from stress, meaning that what they take away from that experience is how anxious and stressed and worried they were. And they were successful. They have put anxious worry together with it turned out okay. This is one of the reasons why uh, anxiety is perpetuated because our brain takes the, the position that the anxiety contributed to things turning out okay. So yeah. bouncing resilience, bouncing forward is learning a new lesson, reframing what happened. No, it wasn't the anxiety. I worked hard to figure this out and I was successful. The lesson is I was successful. The lesson is I'm competent so that the next encounter, you will be less anxious, less worried. So that's a very, very important distinction of how we want to experience our stressful encounters. Learn the lesson, make sure you learn it right so that the next time you will be less anxious, less worried. Yeah, and that that makes sense too because when you have um, when you're <clears throat> tying these things together, your your anxiety uh, being tied to the successful outcome of whatever the thing is, um, then you're like, well, it, I guess if I'm just anxious all the time, I'll be successful all the time. It's is maybe like the way your your brain is is working. Yeah, um, and but, it's not con- doesn't have to be conscious. It's an unconscious right. process, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you you may not even realize it, but you just you kind of associate the, those two things, uh, right. the the anxiety with the success. And it's like, well, fine if I if that's what I need to do to be successful, I want to be successful. I'll just be anxious all the time, and <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to help things, right? right. Um, but let's talk specifically, maybe about folks in the military, maybe even the veteran community. Um, you know, specific challenges that they have uh, with regards to, you know, resilience and, and, and this type of stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. <clears throat> and one of the things that is important to understand is that you, you know what conditioning means. Something happens and keeps happening. Now you begin to expect it, right? Yes. Well, it's important to realize that our nervous system itself can be conditioned. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if you're in danger situations, your nervous system literally becomes sensitized to potential danger. And your nervous system, we call it neuroception. And it happens below the level of awareness. So you're going about your day and suddenly your nervous system picks up on a signal and it's sensitized and your nervous system starts to react with a stress response. Mm -hmm. Now <laughs> you're going about your day and suddenly you notice this physiological reaction and you go, oh my goodness, or it could be unconscious, there must be a danger. Let me look for the danger. There's no danger, right. but your body is telling you there's a danger and you trust your body. And so this is why so many situations we go into, which really are not dangerous, we have this uh, uh, danger reaction to. And so what's the lesson of this? The lesson is if you know that your nervous system is sensitized and can get triggered even though there's no danger, when you notice that, the first reaction that you want to have is a cognitive message to yourself. There may not be any real danger right now. Right. Uh, rather than there's a danger, let me look for it. And if I don't find it, it's just that it's there somewhere, but I can't find it. You didn't so find it yet. Right. You, so, so it's a, in a process that we can all engage in to reverse that reaction. Yeah. So, so as you're, as you're talking, I, I like to kind of just make analogies to, you know, to other, other real life situations. And, um, you're talking about getting conditioned to certain things and, um, immediately the thought popped in my head because it's so funny when it happens is, uh, my dogs, when, when it's time for them to be fed, when we open up the container of food, they come running. I don't care where in the house they are. They hear it. And that sound means it's chow time. We're, we're about to eat and right. they come charging. And then they, you almost are tripping over them because they're like right at your feet and they want that food. Right. Um, and so they've been conditioned to hearing this particular sound equals the good stuff's coming. We're about to get, uh, we're about to get fed. Right. But if that sound, because right now that sound to them is associated with something great. They, they, they're very food motivated. <laughs> and so right. when, but if instead, if that sound was made and you dropped a 10 pound rock on their head every time that it happened, instead of running towards you, they'd go running away because they don't want that to happen. They, they're now associating that sound with something bad. Right. And in the military, you know, when, especially folks who've deployed to combat zones and, and things like that, um, you hear a loud boom. Well, that's a bad thing. That's typically, that's an explosion that, that equals potentially death or injuries or, or things like that. You don't want to be around that. And you want to find out, is there, is there something else that's going to go boom? And mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're not near that thing that's going to go boom. And you, you try to get to, to safety if, if you, if you can. Yes. And so when you hear a dump truck dropping off its load on you know the side of the road or, or wherever it is, and you hear this loud boom and this crashing, you're, you're just conditioned to mm -hmm. hearing that loud noise. <clears throat> and, um, and now you, you're ducking for cover. You, you right. don't want to be around the, those types of things. And, yes. and so, so that, that makes a lot of sense, um, that, that things like that get conditioned into people. Um, and, and if, I would imagine it could probably happen rather quickly, uh, with, with, experiences being what they are. 
So the more dangerous the situation, the more quickly it yes. happens. Okay. Yeah. Because it's a survival mechanism. Right. And if it's if the danger if there's real danger, we learn quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we learn may be appropriate in one environment and not at all appropriate in another environment. That's right. Yeah. So um, your approach, uh, you know, talking about your your book, uh, The Nine Pillars of Resilience and, uh, you know, some of the work that you do, um, how does this address this type of conditioning and how do we I don't know if uncondition is the right word or how do we desensitize that, that conditioning? So it's interesting you use the word desensitize because I'm going to answer you in part A and part B. Okay. So part A is that I actually use a desensitization process to help in this kind of situation. And, and by desensitization, I mean the body can't handle two opposite responses at the same time. Okay. Sure. So now if I use a technique such as meditation, or one of the things I use is biofeedback in which you monitor the person's physiology, feed that information back to them so they can learn to get that physiology under their control. So they can learn to turn down the activation of their nervous system, literally. Okay? okay. So now I train them to come down that continuum of activation. And when they're at a deep place of calm, I introduce or have them introduce some of the stressful situations that they still react to. Now, I'll have them create a hierarchy and then we'll take the least problematic of the hierarchy and start there. So they're, they're in the state of calm, and now they bring in the image of something stressful. But because they're at this place of calm, what happens is through this process, the brain is able to take these memories that, you know, we can say are sort of sitting on the desktop and transfer, transfer them into their hard drive, into their deeper memory, so sure. they're not so reactive. And we can gradually work our way up this hierarchy. So that's what I do for post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other you know, difficult situations that people have. But the part B answer, which is a more general answer to this, is to realize that these conditioned effects are literally in our neural networks. That's what, that's what happens with conditioning. We have representations of them in our neural networks. So we realize on the one hand that that's powerful, but the good news is what else is powerful is neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is our brain's ability to literally rewire themselves with appropriate intention, focus, and training. And so anytime you have a bad a pattern that doesn't serve you, you want to identify a pattern that would serve you and gradually practice that new pattern and hold the intention of doing it. But to, for it to work, it has to be ongoing, consistent, and a practice. So eventually that bad uh, reaction that you would have to whatever you, whatever that stimulus was or the, the trigger was, eventually that gets replaced with something better. Something in, in your words that, that serves you uh, is, is kind of what you're talking about, right? Yes, it's a, it's a long process and the more impactful the, the, le the lesson and the conditioning the longer it will take. Sure. And it's a gradual process. It starts by the event having gradually less and less of a reactive response, even though the memory and the recollection and the emotional reaction is still there. But it's a gradual. You, you keep ref 
when that happens, you keep going over to the healthy response, which might be, okay, I'm in a different environment. It's a much more safe environment. I don't have to react like that. I could react in this way. Mm -hmm. And so you're beginning to literally rewire the brain. It's, it's amazing how the brain works and how it, it can be rewired in that way. Um, but some of those, those run deep, um, you know, especially with how, uh, dangerous a situation might've been. And, um, that might just be, uh, for lack of better words, like that memory has got its heels dug in, uh, to your brain and, uh, it, it doesn't want to move, but with time and consistent effort. And, um, I'd imagine, uh, the recommendation is to do, do this with, uh, under the supervision of a, a therapist of some sort, uh, who, who's able, who's trained in this, uh, to be able to help with this. Um, uh, but with time you, you can, you can start to reverse some of that, right? Yeah, you can. And another one of the keys to the process, which is connected to my fifth pillar of resilience is mental balance and mastery. And in this case, it begins with the, with the notion of a growth mindset. <clears throat> a growth mindset means I, whatever I'm noticing about myself right now, I don't have to be stuck here. I can find a way to grow out of it. Yeah. Okay. And combining that with a... I'm going to do whatever it takes attitude. Okay, this is terrible. And, and right now it's grabbing me and it, it's got me, but I'm committed to doing whatever it takes to shift away from this pattern. Mm -hmm. So that plus a growth mindset facilitates, it literally helps to activate neuroplasticity. Yeah. Uh uh, and because there are people who get stuck and they they don't have what you described as the that growth mindset it's maybe more of a a victim mindset or a um I'm trying to think of another word for it but they, they get stuck in that place that they're in and they they can't seem to get themselves unstuck but I guess part of it is, is that just the will to want to get unstuck, right? Yeah. Now, when we have trauma, it actually creates what we call the freeze response. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually leaves us less capable of that growth mindset. So we have to acknowledge and, ex and recognize that that's a piece of the puzzle. Right. However, just like everything else, if you apply the growth mindset to how you're stuck, you can shift out of that, but you have to have patience. You can't go like two days later and say, oh, this isn't working. It's right. like, no, if you're, if you're following a process, the goal is to trust that eventually you'll start to notice something shifting. But, you know, it's the, the how long it takes is going to be different from one person to another. Yeah. And it probably depends, too, on how traumatic the uh, that that initial uh, response was or, or that initial event was um, and, and what the, that response was uh, to it. Um, but as as you work your way into it, you, you're, it's kind of like a, a hole that you dug yourself and now you're at the bottom of this hole and you're, every time you're, you're working on it intentionally and, and, and trying to get, uh, better with that growth mindset, it's like you're taking one step up the ladder, uh, on your way out of that hole, right? Yes. And, and I'm glad you used that illustration of digging a hole because in many of these cases, it's not that we dug the hole, it, it, we fell into a hole. Sure. Yeah. Right. But a lot of times we judge ourselves because we're not getting out of the hole fast enough. We're not doing the right thing. And so here, the other piece that's so important 
is to be loving and accepting with yourself instead of critical and judgmental. Right. This is my first pillar of resilience, our relationship with ourselves. And when you're going through this process, you want to come from a place of compassion toward yourself, not judgment. You want to come from a place of acceptance, not I should have done better. And you want to give yourself time and patience. Those are key ingredients in a loving and healthy relationship with yourself that will facilitate the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because if you're, yeah, if you're not, uh, you know, comfortable with that, um, you know, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to, to find a, a reason to w want to overcome this, I, I would think. Um, right. You know, it, and for some people, the, the stress and, and the idea of overcoming this stress and, and changing the way you respond to things, um, it, it's a little bit overwhelming uh, to some people because, uh, and, I, and I can understand this, because if you think about the response that you had to a really traumatic event, so let, let's say, you know, it, there was an explosion that, you know, potentially could have injured or killed you or, you know, in, you know, something happened, right? And your response was to duck and cover and, and, you know, whatever it was that, that you did, um, that's the response that you had. And that's what kept you alive. That's what kept you safe. That was the successful outcome, uh, that you were talking about earlier. Um, why would you want to turn that off in, in, in some people's heads? It's like, ah, I, I, I need that because if that, that should happen again, I, I want to keep that, uh, I want to keep that tool in my toolbox. Um, and so, you know, this, this whole idea of like, let's change that mindset and everything could be kind of overwhelming. How do you help people get beyond that feeling of overwhelm with, with yes. this? It, re it reminded me of a, a client I had who was a very well-known comedian. And so he was coming to me because of all his neuroses. And <clears throat> I, we realized in the middle of working with him that he was very resistant to the healing process. And when we got down to it, he was afraid that if he got healthy and norm, normal, he won't be funny anymore. <laughs> oh, I could see that. Yeah. And so what you're saying is, is relevant because we can feel like I don't want to lose my edge. Yeah. And so we have to realize that the, the goal isn't going from this mindset over to this mindset where you're just relaxed all the time. The goal is to expand and include this more calm mindset because we always have the capability, the flexibility of shifting back into this when it's required, when we need to. Yeah. But the other issue about overwhelmed is, is another way of thinking about it, which is so relevant. So a lot of the what happens with people is they think, oh, to be more resilient, I have to do this, I have to do that. It, <laughs> it's like the patient that goes to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you have to get more sleep and you have to stop drinking and you have to get more exercise. And, and the patient walks out saying, I got to get a different doctor. <laughs> <laughs> And so one of the ways that I address this in my book, which is so important because we see the goal as being so far down the road where there's so much that needs to be done, is I talk to people about this notion of the path. And the path is alongside us every moment of every day. And the path is defined by my nine pillars of resilience. And so in my book, I guide people today, right at this moment, if you do a couple of steps based on my model, that puts you on the path. And then once you're on the path, you've succeeded for today. You've achieved success because that path is going to take you to greater and greater resilience. And therefore, all you need to do is get onto the path and you can always 
take a few steps that put you on the path. And people feel such a sense of relief knowing that it's so simple to get onto the path and that being on the path is the goal. Yeah. And it'll take us where we need to go. So it's how I address this notion, which we all experience of overwhelm about how much stress we have in, in our day in our lives. Yeah, and it's it seems like it's it's just take one step at a time um, with, with that, right? As opposed to, like you were saying, the doctor, oh, you have to get more sleep and you have to eat better and you have to exercise and you have to do this, that, and the other, and it gives you 20 things to do. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to find time for that. You know, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. But you, you take small, small chunks, uh, you know, bite sized chunks and, and you, you apply them and, and you do. So just doing the, that one first step, getting on the path and, and that will, that's good enough for today. We don't need to pile on 30 other things that you need to be doing. You, right. you got on the path that, that is, that's a success for today and tomorrow will be another day. We, we have other things that we can worry about tomorrow. Right. Um, but, but then tomorrow c continuously doing the work and, and progressing, um, you, you move down that path to, you know, a better place. And, right. um, and I, I like the thing that you said earlier about, um, how we expand our, um, our capabilities, right? So, it's not like you're losing the ability to react to a dangerous situation that that'll, that'll kick back in, in a fraction of a second. If there truly is a dangerous situation, you'll know what to do. It's not like you're going to forget. Um, it's probably more ingrained than, uh, you know, the, it's like riding a bike kind of thing. It's probably even more ingrained than that. Um, where if you need it, it's there, you'll have it. Now you got to learn this other skill of how do you react to something that trigger stimulus um, when it's not a dangerous situation and you, and you know, it's, it's not a dangerous situation, you know, uh, you know, some, a box drops in the gro grocery store, you know, the guy's putting stuff on the shelf and a box drops and makes loud noise. Well, chances are you're not coming under fire in the grocery store. Uh, just, you know, depending, well, maybe depending on where you live, you never know, <laughs> but, but you know, uh, in, in all seriousness, chances are you're, you're going to be just fine. You're going to go in that grocery store. You're going to get your stuff. You're going to go pay and, and leave and you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really just, I, I guess the way you're saying, just kind of rewiring the way your brain reacts to those types of things, uh, given the, the situation, right? Yeah. You know, I, I want to say something else here that's so important. It's related to my fourth pillar, which is physical balance and mastery. And <clears throat> It's important to realize that if you are um, hypervigilant or reactive, as we're talking about, there is an additional cost to that, okay? So we all have a limited amount of personal energy. Our bodies are like factories producing energy for everything that we do in life out in the world, but also internally. In other words, we need energy to send to our kidneys so that it appropriately uh, filters our blood to help our blood stay in its best condition. You know, a study was done <clears throat> in which a high stress and low stress group were given 10 centimeter incisions in their skin. This is an old study, you can't do it these days. <laughs> <laughs> but the high stress group took twice as long for that wound to heal. And so yeah. stress uh, produces our, the, our bodies want to go into defend and protect the fight or flight response in which we're using our resources to prepare for, for fight or flight. And that uses up precious energy that needs to be recovered, which is why we have to keep the nervous system in a place of balance between the stress component, sympathetic, and the recovery component, parasympathetic. And all of us spend much more time with stresses in our lives than safety 
re, uh, recovery. So we have to hold the intention to find time to go into that recovery mode at night, in the evening, when we sleep, but even throughout the day, but like when we sit down for a meal, we want to say, okay, right now while I'm eating, I'm safe. I can relax, which by the way, will help your digestion. Yeah, it, I, I was actually going to say it, it's got to have an effect on a whole host of different things in your body. Um, you mentioned digestion as just one of those things, but um, going back to the concept of our bodies are like a factory of energy and there's only so much energy. And um, a lot of times when you're feeling like you're low on energy, that's when you start snacking on junk food to give you that quick boost of energy and that's not good for you. And so that leads to other health issues. And, um, you know, know, just that stress is so important to, to be able to have that under control because it could lead to so many other things like you were talking about. And, and it could just make, uh, make things so much worse. And I know now, now people are like, Oh, great. Now you gave me something else to stress about, but, you know, um, but seriously, it's, it's, uh, you know, something that you should, should consider. And <clears throat> when you're, you're looking at this, like, uh, gee, I don't know if I, I really, uh, want to put that time, time and energy into it. it it's, it, it is that important. You, you really should, uh, mm-hmm. consider getting that kind of under control. Um, now, what are some maybe practical strategies or techniques that, that people can use to help develop the resilience in, uh, you know, in their day-to-day lives? Mm-hmm. So let's just take what, what this topic what we're talking about right now, yeah. our personal energy. So you want to hold the intention as a, regular tool, how you start your day, how you think throughout the day, am I keeping my, the two branches of my nervous system in balance? And <clears throat> for most of us, in order to do that, we need to practice some form of relaxation, meditation, biofeedback, something that activates the recovery branch of our nervous system. It won't happen on its own. And if you think that every time we engage in stress, we activate, and then we activate for the next stress and the next stress, we can see that very quickly in our day, we've stretched the resources of our body. And so it's important throughout the day to find these, what I refer to as zones of safety, 10 minutes, even five minutes, where we can say, Okay, for five minutes, let me just breathe and relax. Yeah. And let me just turn everything off for five minutes so that I retrain my body to go deeper into this this continuum of activation. We're training it up all the time. I need to find times where I train it down. So that's that's at the very heart of staying in a place of balance. The second, oh, go ahead. The second key has to do with our relationship with ourself. Sure. And here it's important to start noticing the messages we give to ourselves, what our inner voice is saying, and be aware and notice how we can be critical with ourselves, negative with ourselves, judgmental with ourselves, punitive with ourselves. Okay. All of those things create additional stress and tension. And so I like to say that anytime that you're upset in your life, is you can probably trace it back to some negative message that you're giving yourself, either about yourself or, let, for example, you're going into a room with a group of people, your voice may be saying, be careful, don't make a mistake, or, you know, you may say the wrong thing, or people are going to judge you. All of those are messages that create unnecessary tension. So here's the, the key. Here's the way to address that. I like to identify the qualities of a healthy internal voice, or I like to use the word internal parent. 
Those qualities are coming from a place of love, compassion, acceptance, support, care, and joy. That's the model. That's the model of a healthy internal parent that we all would have loved to have growing up with. Well, whether you did or didn't have that growing up, you can give it to yourself now. And so the process is when you're upset, notice the negative message, or even when you're not, notice the negative messages and you go, no, this doesn't serve me. Let me come over to here and listen to what my healthy internal parent would say to me, coming from those qualities. And that is probably one of the most effective approaches. Again, it's a retraining, a relearning, a rewiring. But if you hold the intention and stay persistent with that, you will literally shift your relationship with yourself. Yeah. Sometimes I, I find people that I talk to uh, who they – they're like, yeah, that, that internal voice just beats me up, you know? Um, and if you think about it, that, that internal voice, if say you had a friend who was going through the same exact scenario that you're going through, would you say the things that that internal voice is telling you? Would you say that to your friend? You know, 99% of the time. No, you're not going to say that to your friend because the friend would be like, man, you're a jerk. (laughs) (laughs) Like, don't like, I don't need this kind of, kind of help. Like that's not helpful at all. (laughs) And, and so it's like, so if you wouldn't say it to your friend, why are you saying it to yourself? And I get it. Trust me. I get it because I've, I've been there too. I I've had that internal voice who's said all that negative stuff. And I'm like, and I'm sitting there listening to it and it, it's not uh, a great place to be, but you know, logically speaking, it, you know, why, why listen to it? You know, just don't give it, don't give it the time of day. And, and like you said, these thoughts aren't serving me. So I'm going to replace it with something that, that does serve me. What, what are my goals? What are my objectives in, in life? And you know, your, your, maybe it's your career, maybe it's in your family, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is that you have going on, uh, you know, like, is this helping me achieve that goal? Is this going to get me closer by constantly beating myself up and knocking myself down or, uh, you know, all these other things that you might do or, um, you know, ducking for cover every time a dump truck dumps its stuff off, you know, none of that stuff is going to help you in, in those other areas. So, you know, why not replace that with something else? And, and that, right. um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you have to have a rationale and a process. So what sure. I say is the, the process is to delegitimize that voice. Uh-huh. And the way to delegitimize that voice is number one is to realize that it's not part of your DNA. You weren't born with it you learned that in your childhood environment. The next is to realize, is to be able to say that was my childhood environment the optimal environment to grow up in? And no one can say yes to that, okay? No one can. And so the next is, well, if if I wasn't born with this and these are lessons that were given to me that I didn't decide on, I didn't determine, let me put a stop to them and let me figure out what are the best lessons. And that's when you could say no to that. This doesn't serve me. Let me come over to this healthy voice, which is the optimal, which is the way I would have been, would have loved to have been raised. And let me start speaking from that voice. And I think your example that you gave a moment ago was really very useful because when you said, you know, what would, would I, if I said this to, to a friend, by doing that, what you're doing is you're taking it from the subjective to the objective. In other right. words, we're subjective about ourselves, but we could be more objective when it comes to friends or our children 
where we don't get caught up in these messages of childhood. So that's a use could be a useful tool. What would I say to a friend? Or if I make a mistake yeah. and I'm beating myself up, if my friend came to me having made that same mistake, what would I say to him or her? And we would sure. be much more loving and caring and accepting. So these are all useful tools to begin shifting that internal voice. Now, on the on the topic of, um, you know, talking about friends and and maybe children or spouse or you know other relationships, there's there's some social support networks and maybe even community type networks that um, you know that have an impact on uh, an individual's resilience, right? Um, you know, how can how can these people? develop these support networks to uh, kind of help improve their resilience and maybe even the resili resilience of the other folks who are involved in these, uh, these networks? Well, <clears throat> this has to do with two other pillars of my model. My second pillar is relationship with others. And my third pillar is relationship with something greater. So let's start with relationship with others. We're just talking about the optimal way of treating ourselves, coming from that loving place and not being critical or negative. Well, that should be guidelines in terms of the relationships that we establish and the relationships that we spend our time in, where we eliminate or minimize relationships where the other person is critical or judgmental or in competition with us. Uh, and look more for relationships that are loving, relationships in which we feel safe and can let down our guard. Because when we're in a healthy, loving relationship and we can let down our guard, what we get from the other person is emotional nourishment. And that's just as good as good food relationship with something greater, and this is how we connect to the larger community. And here it could be spirituality. Uh, it could be finding meaning and purpose in our lives that give a, gives us a bigger horizon to our lives and that connects us to community. And there, it could be participating and being a member of a group that has the same positive, loving, supportive um, direction. And it's giving service, which helps us give back, but connects us to the larger community so we don't feel alone or isolated. We feel supported. And if you look at all the so-called blue zones around the world, communities around the world that have the highest longevity community relationship is a key component hmm. of their longevity. And so we can take a lesson from that and look for that in our own lives. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I feel like that, that does make sense because when you have something bigger than yourself to, uh, to either serve, maybe it's in a volunteer capacity, maybe it's it's just the the community that you live in. It's just something bigger than yourself. Um, you talked about spirituality and religion and stuff. That that's certainly something bigger than yourself. Um, service to your country or your community or whatever. That's that's something bigger than yourself. Um, it gives you something to work towards uh you know it, it gives you something to um get out of bed in the morning and be like i i need to get better so i can be better i can show up better for those people i i can be the best fill in the blank whatever it is for those people i can be the best one of those things uh for those people um you know just taking it to a military context uh i'm gonna get out of bed i'm gonna go do my exercise and i'm gonna uh go do my training and all that stuff uh, in the military because I want to be the best soldier that I could be so I, I can serve my country in the best way possible. Um, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, spirituality, um, you know, I want to have the, uh, a, a close relationship with, 
uh, with God, whatever your religion happens to be. You know, I, I want to be the best that I can be, uh, you know, with that. And so that gives you something bigger to work towards. Um, and uh, I can definitely see how that, that impacts the longevity of those those people who have more of that community connection um, because in addition to helping the community by getting better, that person indiv- on an individual level is also getting better. And that you realize quickly the things that don't serve you in serving whatever that other uh, bigger thing is. And you, you do work to get, not, not get rid of, but um, make sure that they are not impacting you uh, as as much as as they could be if you were in isolation, maybe. Well, it's also giving you opportunities to feel good about yourself. Okay, yeah, that's a good good point. And that's that's very important. My sixth pillar of resilience is emotional balance and mastery. And one of the keys to emotional balance and mastery is being able to go into a state of gratitude and love. And we actually know that when you're in a state of gratitude, it actually supports optimal physiological functioning. The balance that I was talking about are the two branches of your nervous system. So, With my fourth pillar, I was mentioning practicing some form of relaxation. If you incorporate into a practice of meditation or relaxation, going into and practicing gratitude, you are encouraging your nervous system to also go into this place of balance. And all of these things, they may not be second nature to that person who is in that high stress, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, the muscle memory just isn't there, uh, if you will, right? They, it's something like you said, you have to be intentional about this. You you have to uh, really be, uh, you know, focused on this is the thing I want to accomplish. I want to uh, focus on meditation or, or my, my gratitude or, you know, all, all these other things that we are talking about. You have to be uh, in that position where you are um, intentionally trying to uh, achieve that um, in, in your life versus, yeah. versus just, it'll just happen to you. Like it's, it's not something that, that just happens uh, the same way that uh, the way you might have gotten yourself into that, you know, where, where maybe a traumatic event might have happened to you, no thought about it whatsoever, and it happened, and your body is now reacting to it, um, you, yeah. you're going to have to do the work to get out, right? Yeah. But so, I mean, that's why uh, Michael Ovitz referred to this as a handbook for living your best life. Yeah. Because... A lot of this, most of this is not second nature to us. You need some guidance. And the way I've designed my book is to make it easy for people to take it step by step by step. So any morning you can open up the book to almost any page and read one page and it'll give you one tool, one technique for you to pay attention to that day and get good at that. Next day, you read another page that gives you another tool technique to follow for that day. And and I think, like you were saying earlier, that consistency is key. Um, You know, think about anything that um, that you do. If you do it once or twice, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be super proficient in it. Um, you know, even, even think, think about learning to play a sport or something, you know, whether it's, you know, throwing a baseball or hitting a golf ball or, you know, something like that, you go out and you practice once or twice, you're not making it into the pros, (laughs) you know, you're not going to get there. Um, you know, if you, if you just practice on occasion here and there, um, might be fine if, if it's just a casual hobby that you have, but you're not going to get proficient. And, And in this case, we're looking for, uh, you know, people to, to get uh, rather proficient in 
in this so that they build that resilience within themselves. And, and it does require practice. And, and we were saying earlier about that analogy about falling into a hole and then having to climb out. Um, that falling into a hole, it's like that thing I was saying before that happened to you, that, that traumatic event maybe that happened to you. Um, it's really easy to fall into a hole. Um, the gravity does all the work and, and it gets you into that hole. Um, but it's going to take a little bit more effort to climb your way out. And, and that, that's why I, I really do like that analogy. I'm glad that you, you mentioned that. Um, yeah. because, uh, because it, it does take more work to get out that way. Um, and then it does to get in. And so, um, you know, with any of this, it's going to, going to take some work. Um, yes. but, with all the tools that you outlined, and, and I'm, I know your book um, has more. I obviously don't want to give away everything from the book. I want people to go out and, and get a copy of it. But again, the book is The Nine P Pillars of Resilience, The Proven Path to Master Stress, Slow Aging, and Increase Vitality. Um, so uh, I do want to encourage folks to go out and get a copy of that book. Um, before we wrap up, uh, is there... There anything else that you'd like to share uh, with the audience? Maybe uh, where they can go to find out more information uh, of, about you or or the book or anything like that. Yeah, I want to make two final points. Yeah, sure, please. So thank thank you. The first one is we have to keep our eye on the benefits of what we're talking about. That's so important that we realize the benefits are staying healthy, mm -hmm. less pain, less symptoms, less illness slowing the aging process and increasing our health span, staying functional well into old age, those and performing at our best. Those are the benefits of what we're talking about. So that's, yeah. that's so important for all of us to realize, however this, we feel like this is a lot of work, what's the alternative, right? Okay, <laughs> right. So that's number one. And number two, you know, what I'm making available to your audience is my resilience assessment booklet that define, that gives a definition and description of my nine pillars of resilience, but includes a questionnaire that everybody can take, self-score, and derive their personal resilience profile, showing the areas of their strength and areas that they need greater work on. So that's an amazingly useful tool as a starting point. Great, great. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, it, it takes a lot of work, um, but, but like you said, uh, you know, consider the alternative. Um, it ta also takes a lot of work uh, to not age gracefully, let's put it that way. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, so, so it takes, it does take a lot of work, you know, when, when those illnesses are constantly, uh, keeping you from the things that you want to be doing or the, the injuries or the other things that, that are happening, um, that, that takes a lot of work too, to recover Absolutely. from all of those things. So, um, imagine if you just didn't have to, and, and you could, uh, you can live life in a happy, healthy, uh, way and, and right. deal with the stress effectively. So right. and um, that's what we're talking about. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, I will have, uh, links for the listeners, t uh, in the show notes to your book and, you know, other information, your social media, your website and, and things like that for folks to, uh, you know, reach out and, and find out more information if they, they're interested. Um, uh, but it has been a pleasure uh, talking with you today, uh, Dr. Sidoroff, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, you know hearing uh, from the listeners what they they think of this and uh, you know what they're taking away from it uh, you know when they they get a copy of your book. So uh, looking forward to that, um, and thank you again for taking the time to come on. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book, Surviving Sun, on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts.